up in Zoom now. What's going on? What's going on, everybody? I see you here in Zoom. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad to have you for the Financial Church. This is our Sunday service. Excited to be here with you on this Sunday to share with you this preaching. Here we call it preachings. It's a combination of preaching and teaching. We don't just want to leave you on some spiritual high that leaves you with no actionable steps to take throughout your week or impact your life. Uh, and so I make sure that I combine it with the teaching. And that's why I want you to come over and join us in Zoom so that you can see the PowerPoint slides that I teach from um, to really anchor uh, what I'm sharing. So we won't just be pulling from scriptures and things of that nature. We're really going to be going in uh, deep. And so I want you to come see the visuals because I know that we are very image-based people and um, the power of imagery. So uh, again, if you're on Instagram, join us at juliangordon.com forward slash TFC, juliangordon.com forward slash TFC. And uh, we are going to get started in just a second. I see you all in here uh, in Zoom, Andrea, Angelica, Carmelita. I see all the vets, Katina, Christopher, Deirdre, Dorothy, Dewan, uh, Dewan, Gwen, Janine, Jaritza, Joe, Keisha, La, La Elena, Leslie, Loressa, Lynn Marie, Melissa, Rosemary, Tafara, Atisha, Tracy, Alvita, and Xavier, um, and other folks are coming on in. So good to see you all here. Um, I hope you had a great week. Uh, obviously, um, we had the unfortunate um, death. I can't call death unfortunate. Um, it's unfortunate for those who uh, didn't fully honor the life while it was here, but um, death is a normal transition uh, when you operate in the spiritual realm. It's just a, it's like going from uh, child to teenager, teenager to adult, you know, adult to elder. It's, it's kind of like one of those transitions, except of course, we leave the physical body. Um, so we uh, send blessings to Chadwick on the next step of his journey. Uh, I wrote a eulogy to him in uh, my Instagram post. I don't know if you got a chance to read that, um, but that uh, resonated with a lot of people in terms of my perspective on death and his transition. He had obviously a huge impact. Um, huge he literally transmuted, he literally transmuted came in as a spirit into a body known as Chaswick Bozeman. And while in that body, he resurrected James Brown. He resurrected Thurgood Marshall. He resurrected Black Panther, which was an African king and a freedom fighter who fought against white inferiority, projected as white supremacy. And he uh, came in and he represented Thoth, uh, with, uh, Thoth, which is the Egyptian god of wisdom. So um, here we have this spirit who came into a physical body, took this idea of motion pictures or pictures in motion, and actually reincarnated some of the most powerful figures in uh, African history. And so uh, we are grateful for him being able to do that. Um, and uh, he served his work. Um, in that eulogy, I mentioned that, you know, we wonder why the, the quote unquote good die young. Um, and it's not because they did something wrong, it's because they did something right. Uh, you actually have to earn to die, y'all. You actually have to earn to die, meaning that once you've done your work and fulfilled your purpose, then you can go. And so you wonder why we have people like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Che Guevara, uh, Chadwick Boseman, Nipsey Hussle, Tupac, Biggie, et cetera. Guess what? They serve their purpose. <laughs> Okay. Now, this is not a race to say, oh, take me first because I, I want to serve my purpose so fast. Everybody's purpose has a different timeline in terms of its fulfillment. But um, when you've done all the work that you were meant to do while you were here, it's time to go. You don't have anything else to do. You checked off the to-do list item that is most important. See, a lot of people are running through this life and they are checking off all these other to-do list items, right? Checking off all kinds of to-do list items. Look at me, I graduated from this school. I got to six figures. I got a house, this and that. Checking off all these to-do list items. But if you come through life and you check off every to-do list item, but you fail to check off the one thing that you were created to do, which is walk in your purpose, then it's all for naught. In fact, you will never actually be fulfilled just checking off all these other to-do list items when you fail to check off and do the one thing that you were created to do, all right? So um, that's what we want to get focused on. For me, this is why financial spirituality is so important because one of the number one blockages for people is this infatuation with money. 
It's this infatuation and giving so much thought, energy, and power to money, so much so that we have even put on the dollar bill, in God we trust. Now, of course, we perceive that here in Financial Church um, as an affirmation. In God we trust, we release the money, and then when it comes back to us in returns, we say, in God we trust it. Um, but we've even deified money, and um, that is out of alignment. Um, that is financial sin because we know who and what the true source of our supply is, and that is the creator, whether there's money here on earth or in your pants or in your pocket or in your bank account, you still have a source of supply that is more infinite and abundant and powerful than money. That we don't use the language almighty dollar here. We do not use the language almighty dollar. There is no power in that dollar except the power that we give it when we transmute that energy into ideals, ideas, individuals, and institutions that we believe in, okay? Otherwise, it is no worth no more than this post-it. That dollar bill is actually worth no more than this post-it until we actually transmute that energy and use it. It is useless until you use it, okay? It is useless until you use it, all right? So this is our awareness and we have a different relationship or we are cultivating a different relationship to money um, in this teaching. And so I'm so glad to have you here uh, to experience this, all right? So um, with that, uh, I'm gonna share my slide. <laughs> I, was, I was ready to go in, y'all. I was, I was ready to go in. Um, but uh, we got to order, and just like the universe has order, God has order. Um, we want to follow the steps, all right? Uh, we don't want to skip steps, um, and we want to get into the right mindset and space to be able to receive this particular message today. Um, again, I'm glad to have you here, honored uh, to see you coming back. In fact, um, how many of you are vets? How many of you are vets, and how many of you are new? Type new if you're new. Type vet if you're a vet. I know I got a lot of vets. Y'all my true... Uh, I don't call you followers. You're not followers. You are partners. You are um, on this journey with me. Um, we're not. We're not followers in this play in this way. And I learn from you all as well. So, um, oh, we got a lot of new folks: Katina, Samsung, Galaxy Phone, Marlena. Good, good, good. And then I got some multifamily movement um, members here as well. So this is good. Multifamily movement members, they're getting it on both sides. They're getting it from the heaven, which is what our mental experience, and then earth, which is our material experience. So when we hear the language on earth as it is in heaven, when we hear the language on earth as it is in heaven, what that is saying is that whatever we have in our mental experience, right, we also want that to manifest in our material experience. That's when we know that we've actually fully embraced it and fully believe it. How many of you have uh, ever experienced or been in a mental hell, though everything around you might have been heavenly? Everything around you looked perfect on the outside, but you are in a mental hell, right? Or you've been in a mental heaven while everything around you was actually in, in an earthly hell, right? For a lot of people, the coronavirus and the pandemic, um, not for a lot of people, for people like us, we were able to stay in a heaven state mentally even though the external experience that most people were having was one that seemed hellish, Armageddon-like, right? The end of the world, et cetera. So um, we are trying to align those two. We are trying to align those two. When those two are aligned, we are actually walking in the kingdom of heaven, okay? Heaven being this ethereal, intangible, unseen, immaterial thing, and a kingdom being actually a physical thing. When those two things are aligned, when it is done on earth as it is in heaven, which is all of our work, which is to bring heaven on earth, whatever you believe and think of in your mind that you think will bring greater good and more, bring more good and more God into the world, when that is aligned and that is happening, you are actually in the kingdom. <laughs> You're in the kingdom. That's why Jesus said, it's neither here nor there. It is in your midst, <laughs> okay? When those two things are aligned, so all of our work is to bring heaven on earth. When we look at Chadwick, we saw him do that in his art. You know, this is a man who never dressed up. This is a black man, an actor, who never got into a dress, okay? Who never got into a dress. You know, Hollywood has tried to, or actually what I call it is unholywood. Unholywood has this infatuation with putting black men in dress on screen. He didn't do that, okay? He knew who he was and what his purpose was, and there was no time to F around. Right. And so he only took roles that dignified him and his people. OK, so be mindful when you're watching movies from Unholywood, because that is typically a, a particular group of people who are trying to control and shape perception of reality. 
and even plant seeds for future. This is why you see them put the same movies about themselves over and over and over again to continue to tell their narrative and their history and how bad they had it. And as a result of their fear-based uh, consciousness, um, they feel like they have to control perception even so much as so as having, as, even so much so as having a whole organization to prevent other people from talking bad about them. Why would you care if somebody else is talking bad about you if you know who you are? Why does it matter? So we have to be mindful of what, where we are. We know that uh, we know who the true children of Israel are um, if we do our study and our, do our own research. And, um, and we need to walk in that understanding because when you know who you are and whose you are, uh, you walk more dignified and you walk with more power, but our legacy has been stolen in many ways and um, we are here to reclaim it, okay? So with that, let's continue moving forward. Um, today, we are doing our monthly accounting our monthly accounting ritual. We do this on the closest Sunday to the first of the month. And this is a ritual that we do to make sure that we are being the best stewards of po as possible of our economic resource that is coming to us and through us. Remember, the goal of this game is not to have the most money. The per richest person and the wealthiest person is not the person who dies with the most money in their name. That is not the name of the game. Okay, so when I think about it, what we say or what I say is the buck does not stop here. You know, a lot of people say the buck stops here and as if it's a good thing. My creator knows that the buck does not stop here. When economic resource, cash, currency flows to me and through me, it knows that I'm going to channel that energy, this money, money just being stored energy. Okay, money is just stored energy. It knows that I'm going to use that stored energy and transmute it into other ideals, idea, good ideals, uh, ideas, individuals, and institutions that I believe are doing good or God's work in the world. Okay, so um, the wealthiest person is the person who circulates the most money, not the person who has the most money in their possession when they die, but it's the person who circulates the most money. Okay, the most currency, and, it, and it's not just money, okay? There's other types of currency. We have our personal capital, our intellectual capital, our social capital, our in, uh, financial capital. We have physical capital, we have human capital. There's all types of currencies that exist, okay? And the wealthiest person is the one who circulates it the most, not the one who has the most at the end of the day. When you are holding on or hoarding money, um, that is actually a financial sin. That's one of the greatest financial sins. Saving money beyond your emergency fund is financial sin. Saving money beyond your emergency fund is one of the greatest financial sins, okay? Because typically we only save money because we are fear-based. Yes, you should cover your downside in case something just ish hits the fan, okay? You don't want to be, uh, well, Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have saved anything. And in fact, he told his disciples, just leave everything, take your clothes and sandals and let's go get this, right? Because he was fully tapped into abundant bank. He had the longest line of credit that ever existed, or he was aware. We actually have the same, we all have access to the same line of credit, right, to Abundant Bank. If my father is the uh, founder of Abundant Bank and I'm his son, then I can go in there and get a loan or get whatever I need whenever I need it. And when we have that awareness of who we are as God's children, as children of God, then uh, we can move with that kind of power, right? And I've told you before, if I'm a millionaire, is my daughter a millionaire? If I'm a millionaire, is my daughter a millionaire, y'all? If I'm a millionaire, is my daughter a millionaire? Yes or no? It's very transparent. If I'm a millionaire, my daughter is a millionaire. Now, has she received a million dollars? No, she is not, okay? Why? Because she is not ready to receive it and she's not even aware of her own abundance, okay? When I take her to a closing on a property, she's not aware that she has 12 properties to her name. She's not aware of that. Okay, not fully aware. She's starting to become aware of it. But then on top of that, she's not ready to receive. She's not ready to manage or can hold uh, what I'm ready to give uh, when I'm ready to give to her. Okay, so that doesn't stop her from being a millionaire. The, the only thing that's stopping her is her awareness of it and her readiness to receive it. Okay, and that's the only thing that's stopping us too. Okay, is our awareness of what is actually ours and then our readiness to receive it. All right. So this is how we are moving. So we're doing this today. And again, the guiding question is, am I being a good steward of money and how can I improve? All right. So for those of you who are new, um, financial spirituality, I want to share with you the definition. Uh, the definition of financial spirituality is the practice of mastering manifestation and money by learning how God creates, 
and using the power of your mind, image, and nation, prayers, words, and works to bring heaven, the mind, okay, on earth, which is the material, so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. We must all know that we are all already manifesting. You are already a master manifester, okay? The life that you have is one that you created. Now, you may say that there's been a lot of influences in my life, Julian, that I didn't have control over, and this is not the life I would have created for myself. Well, the challenge with that is that if we give power to all of those influences that occurred in the past or that are still occurring today, then that actually takes power away from us. And that says that in order for us to have the life that we desire, those things must change. Those institutions and those individuals and those people and those conditions must change for me to have the life that I desire. If we move in that way, then we are almost powerless because it is hard enough to change ourselves, let alone hard enough to change somebody else or another institution. So even if it is true that you have been impacted by outside forces that have co-created your life or influenced your life to be what it is today, it serves us in no way to actually blame or give power to those things. And it is actually best for us to accept full responsibility, 100% responsibility for the life that we are living. When we do that, then we can step into our power and we can be co-creators alongside the mother, father, God, okay? So we all are master manifestors already. The question is, is are we deliberately creating the life that we want? Are we being deliberate creators? And have we created the experience that we desire, okay? This is what we must be aware of. And again, we must accept 100% responsibility. Not saying that there aren't other influences, but to the extent that we give those influences power, uh, it actually takes power away from us. Like for instance, if we use poverty as a reason for why we're not, I grew up in poverty, okay? How many of you grew up in poverty, okay? How many grew up in poverty? Let me know. How many grew up in poverty? Okay. I guess a few people, a few people. So hear this. What tends to happen is we, um, when we grow up in poverty, uh, when we grow, we grow up in poverty, we see poverty around us and therefore we say, I am poor. Okay. But that is not the truth. Okay. The reality is that poverty is an external condition, but when we actually turn it into the language, I am poor, we are now accepting it as an internal identity. Okay. But if you know who you truly are, if you know that you are a child of God, the most infinite and abundant source and supply in the entire world and universe, then your identity, that identity as child of God never changes, even if your external circumstances do not reflect it. So you can actually be wealthy in the midst of poverty as the conditions that you were seeing with your two eyes. And what that puts you in position to do is now demonstrate how wealthy you are by now starting off in poverty. You have the opportunity to demonstrate how wealthy you truly are, right? By starting off in the condition of poverty. Someone who starts off in the condition of wealth can't actually really demonstrate how wealthy they really are because a lot of their wealth was, they were born into that wealth. For those of you who were born into poverty, you actually got, get, are in a position to be better demonstrators of how wealthy you actually are. Does that make sense, y'all? Does that make sense? Okay. Each generation is supposed to take it to the next and next and next level. We are elevating in consciousness. We are like, so life does repeat itself, but it's like a DNA. DNA is this double helix, right? And it's circular. But the thing is, is that this helix goes up and up and up. So life does happen in cycles, but it's cycling upward as we all ascend. Remember, we do not want descendants. Descendants implies that it starts with us and everything else goes downhill from there. And the way the story of Adam and Eve is told is that it started with these two individuals and then it was just downhill from there, okay? That's not how we operate. That's not how we think about, that's not how I think about um, how God wants us to be. Instead, we are seeking to create ascendants. So it starts from here and then with each generation, you're ascending. When you draw out a family tree, you start with the base as far as you can go back, and then the tree goes up and up and up towards what? Towards the sun, towards the light, okay? It is reaching higher and higher and higher towards the light. And so we are seeking to have ascendance, not descendants, 
okay? Descending is down, ascending is up, all right? So um, here, uh, I rely heavily on uh, the Bible um, as the foundational text, but I source many different texts, but I do believe that this is one of the richest books on the face of the earth. It has stood the test of time. And when you were able to look at it and read it with your third eye, you were able to see things in it that um, on the surface you cannot see. It's kind of like a seven layer dip. When you have a seven layer dip, you do not just take off the first layer. But many people read this text and they only look at the first layer. A lot of people look at it and they read the book literally. This book is full of allegories and stories and hidden meanings. And it's only your third eye and intuition that can actually see those things. If a lot of people say, oh, the Bible's literal, it's fact and this and that. Well, my question to them is then why haven't you cut off your right hand? Why haven't you gouged out your eye if you're supposed to be taking this book literally? Okay, so you have to be very mindful and try to be aware of when the Bible is actually historical and it's more factual and when it's more allegorical. Okay, you have to be able to use or ask for guidance. Don't ask me. Don't even ask anybody outside of yourself. Ask inwardly and say, is this, is this God, is this being historical right now? Or is this being allegorical? A lot of the Old Testament is historical, okay? Um, but there's a lot of allegory hidden in there. And then, um, and then the New Testament, uh, it's, especially the Gospels, it's very allegorical. Jesus rarely ever spoke in just plain direct fact, okay? Rarely spoken that. I'll give you an example in the Old Testament. I'll give you an ample example in the whole Old Testament. Um, when you think of the parting of the Red Sea, what do you think is the deeper meaning of the parting of the Red Sea, y'all? What do you think is the deeper meaning of the parting of the Red Sea? <laughs> you think the Red Sea or the Reed Sea really just parted open like that? You think that's what happened? On a woman's body, where's the Red Sea, y'all? On a woman's body, where, where's the Red Sea? Go ahead and type it, it's okay. Where's the Red Sea on a woman's body, y'all? Huh? It's her vagina. <laughs> the parting of the Red Sea is the opening of the woman's vagina or uterus in order to give birth to a new people. It's the opening of a woman's birthing system in canal in order to give birth to a new people, y'all. <laughs> you have to be very, very careful. And the writers were so good or I don't want to call them the writers. They were more so instruments and vessels that were getting these divine downloads and they got them through on the paper. This book is written so magically um, that it can only be divine intervention that created this text in my, in my mind. Do I, do, do I believe that it's been remixed and adulterated by men? Yes, I do believe that that is so, especially with the Nicene Conference, okay? They started taking out books and scriptures and changing words and things of that nature. But I do believe that this, book in general is divinely inspired. And even with the remixing of it, I, I believe that you can still see the truth that is in there. Okay. So uh, I also believe that Jesus is perhaps one of the richest, uh, not perhaps the richest man to ever walk the face of this earth. But of course, he didn't uh, store material wealth because he was so in tune with who he was that he didn't need to store any material wealth. If he wanted to, he could have had all the kingdoms. He could have manifested gold. He could have been an alchemist if he wanted to. Obviously, he was manifesting bread, right, by the thousands and loaves uh, and fish instantaneously. Why do I need to carry around a wallet or money or gold or talents, which we know talents weigh a whole bunch, okay? You know, the parable of the talents, we know that ta we did that study and we know that pa talents weigh like, I think, 60 pounds. Why do I need to carry around these talents when I can manifest on demand? This is ultimately where we all want to be in our, uh, our oneness with the mother, father, God, okay? So some beliefs that we have here uh, or that I have, okay? I just, for those of you who are new, I want you to be fully aware that I'm not trying to convince you to believe uh, or believe what I believe. I encourage you to go do the work yourself um, and see what resonates with you, okay, inside. I'm not encouraging you to believe me. I'm not trying to persuade you. This is my belief system that has allowed me to manifest at the level that I've been able to manifest. And all I'm doing is sharing it with you. You can take what, what benefits you and leave what does not. You can take what resonates with you and leave what is not. But I know for a fact, there will likely be at least one thing that you hear today that will resonate with you, that will move you an inch closer towards wealth consciousness from poverty consciousness. That is the whole goal of this ministry is to move from poverty consciousness to wealth consciousness. 
And we are doing that week by week by week, day by day by day. So some of the core beliefs that uh, I teach here are that one, I believe that as a child of God, I have access to everything that is in God's will for me to have, and I will receive it when I'm ready. I seek first the kingdom of God, knowing that all the things I need will be added unto me. I'm about my father's business, mother, father's business. And when I am, I will have life and have it more abundantly. Um, I honor the mother God here. Um, you can only create woman from woman and man. Okay. So uh, I know that this text has actually, the Bible has actually left women out in every, every role that woman plays is usually uh, with the exception of Mary Magdalene. Um, every role that woman is played, she's usually the one that uh, is messing something up and uh, or the, the cause of evil and seduction and temptation. And I don't believe that to be true. Um, uh, so I recognize the mother, father, God. Uh, I believe that I'm here to manifest divine ideas planted in, in the heaven of my mind on earth, which is my material experience. And I believe that there's more than enough. I have more than enough and I am more than enough for God is the infinite source of my supply. Okay. So with that, before we uh, step into it, uh, we, um, we honor the breath. Um, in Genesis 2, 7, it said, then Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, man being mankind, um, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then man became a living being. So we all are fully aware that we are being breathed through at every single moment, that we aren't the ones that are breathing. If I asked you to hold your breath, many of you might be able to hold your breath for 30 to 60 seconds, but then there is something that you cannot stop that would actually cause you to breathe. Right. Because we are being breathed through just like a, a trumpet, just like a clarinet, just like a flute is being breathed through. There is something right, a larger entity that is breathing through us. And so if we want to connect with that larger entity. Right. Um, all we have to do is take a moment to pause and honor that breath and get in tune with that breath. Um, the way we define that here is uh, in heaven. What we do here, I don't know where this text went in. We in heaven and then we exhale. Okay. We in heaven and we exhale. Okay. We don't inhale. No, we are bringing heaven in. Okay. And we are exhaling. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to do three, uh, three deep breaths. Uh, what we typically do is four seconds in, hold for one second, release for five. Um, you can close your eyes. You can open your eyes. You can have your palms up, palms down. I don't care. All I'm inviting you to do for the next 30 seconds is to join us and do whatever you do best to get in tune with your creator. If that means you doing a headstand, if that means you getting on your knees and praying, whatever it is for you, I want you to get in touch so that um, your mind can be open and you ask for uh, divine listening as we go through today's teaching. All right, so I'm going to initiate the breathing and we'll go from there. Deep breath in. Hold. Release. Deep breath in. Hold. Release. Deep breath in. Hold. Release. All right. So with the exception of those who have asthma and those who might be experiencing coronavirus, which is a respiratory disease, okay, um, most of us don't think about when our next breath is going to come. We trust that the Mother, Father, God is going to provide that next breath for us. How many are you worried about oxygen today? How many are you worried about oxygen today? Anybody in here worry about oxygen today? Like they wake, woke up and was like, I wonder if there's going to be enough oxygen out there for me to breathe today. No. Okay, so hear this, y'all. Wealth consciousness is when you relate to money in the same way you relate to air. True wealth consciousness is when you relate to money in the same way that you relate to air. You know that the mother, father, God is going to provide for you what you need when you need it. It is a high calling. It is not an easy place to get to. Actually, it is easy to get to, but we put all kinds of blockages in the way. Julian, what about this? All kinds of fear, doubt, and worry come in between reaching that level of consciousness. This is what we all are aspiring to do. I won't even say that I'm there yet, okay? I'm getting very close to being there, 
Um, but uh, I still have my own stuff, okay? So wealth consciousness is when you relate to money in the same way that you relate to air. Mm -hmm. And air is actually more important to you than money. Air is more valuable to money. So you can trust it for air, but why can't we trust it for money? We can trust God for oxygen every single day without worry. But for some reason, we have blockages when it comes to trusting God for something that's less valuable to us than air, which is money. All right, so let's keep on moving. So uh, this is a question um, for those who are new. Um, those who are new, um, uh, we start off uh, the, these uh, monthly rituals with the question, who wants to be a millionaire? I'm sure you've seen that show. Uh, how many of you want to be a millionaire? How many want to be a millionaire? Those of you who are new, let us know. You got to claim it. How many want to be a millionaire? Marlena said millionaire plus. <laughs> All right. So this is somewhat of a trick question, y'all, because here in this teaching, we know in Psalm 23, 1, it said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not what? I shall not what? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. <laughs> Wait a second. I just said I wanted to be a millionaire, but then the scripture is telling me that I shall not want. So what does this really mean, Julian? What this means is that we never say I want something, okay? Instead, we say I am it. Because when I am it, I become it, then I attract what it is. So rather than saying I want to be a millionaire, because if we say I want to be a millionaire, you know how many people have said I want to be a millionaire? and they stayed in a state of wanting. They said, I want to be a millionaire. Almost everybody in their life had probably said that at some point in time, and they stayed in a state of wanting. Why? Because they never embraced the identity of a millionaire. We don't want just external conditions to change. We want our identity to change. Once our identity becomes that of a millionaire, then we know that our external conditions will match our identity. When our identity becomes that of a millionaire, vibrationally of a millionaire, okay? I'm not saying, when I say millionaire, I'm not saying some 40-year-old uh, white man who's in tech. No, I don't want you, that's not the image of millionaire that I want you to think of. I want you to think of uh, a millionaire as a, vibration, as, as a vibration or a frequency that you can tune into. And when you tune in to that vibration or frequency internally as your identity, then through the law of correspondence, as Tafara said, right, through the law of correspondence, which is really the law of attraction, then your external conditions have to match who you are. You don't get what you want, y'all. You do not get what you want. You get who you are. Actually, I'm going to type that in, y'all. I'm going to type that in. You do not get what you want. You get who you are. You do not get what you want, you get who you are. That's heavy. That's heavy. How many of y'all think that's heavy? You do not get what you want because you could talk about everything that you want. <laughs> you get who you are. So when you become the type of individual that naturally has those kind of things, then they will come into your life. So we change identity here first. We don't try to just pray to God that our external conditions change. We change our identity. If I'm going to change the world, I need a world of change in me. If I want my world to change, I need a world of change in me. I don't need the president to change. I don't need my mama to change. I don't need my significant other to change. I don't need my children to change. I don't need my boss to change. I don't need my employer to change. I don't need my city to change. I don't need anything outside of myself to change. I change. And then my entire experience of this material, my entire material experience changes. Okay? So this is the process and this is um, a non-traditional route, y'all. This is a non-traditional route. It's actually an easier route, but it's non-traditional, okay? Most people pray for everything but themselves to change, okay? We pray that we change, that we become better, that we become stronger, that we become more aligned, that we become more conscious, that we become more giving, that we become more receiving. Wait a second, Julian, what do you mean we're receiving? Because we know that in order to give, we must receive 
comparably. In order to continue to give sustainably, we must receive proportionally to the amount that we want to give. Otherwise, we will burn out. Many of us here are great givers. Many of us here are great givers and we are lacking in the skill set of receiving. So if you want to give more, you have to become a better receiver. You have to receive more. Okay, it's just, it's just balance. It is balance. Okay, but that's not what we're taught. We've been taught these sacrificial modalities um, and even they portrayed the story of Jesus as this sacrificial, as a savior, okay? Sacrificial, right? We honor sacrificial leaders, people who gave up their life for us, et cetera, right? But in order to sustainably give, we actually have to receive. That is not the leadership, that is not the leadership modality that's going to lead to the change that we desire, okay? So, <clears throat> um, so uh, normally we go over the seven types of millionaires. I'm not going to go into that because I, uh, I realize that I've been, I've been preaching a lot already, okay? So uh, I want to catch us up a little bit, um, and uh, I want to go to Luke 16, 1 through 2, because a lot of people are like, Julian, why are you talking about money, this and that, financial spirituality? Uh, well, I just need to, I need to just serve and do God. And yes, that is true, right? We seek ye first. Remember, if there's sequences, right? We seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then we know that all the things that we need will be added unto us. So there's sequences. It does not say that you cannot be both, okay? So in Luke 16, one through two, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management. So that is what we are doing every single uh, first Sunday of the month or closest Sunday to the first of the month is that we are giving an account of our management or our stewardship of the economic resource that we've been, we've been provided over the past 30, 31 days. Now, last week I shared with you a deep insight that I, I got uh, from the scripture, right? It's just as deep as uh, the parting of the Red Sea, okay? And in Matthew 21, 12 through 13, it said, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, uh, the scriptures declares, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves, okay? And so in this scripture, we know that the temple is where, y'all? We know that the temple is here. Point to the temple. Point to the temple. We know that the temple is here. And so the allegory behind this story is that Jesus was saying that we as humanity have made the temple a temple of buying and selling, where we are pondering and thinking about money and exchange like 90% of the time. With 90% of the time, we're thinking about how do I make more money? My bills, how am I going to pay these bills? I got this bill to pay. I need money for this. We have turned the temple into a den of thieves. Who are we thieving from? Who are we thieving from? Who are we thieving from? We are taking our thought energy away from God. If you trusted God, you'd have more than enough that you need. If you seek ye first the kingdom of God, then all those things will be provided unto you. And Jesus said this, um, you know, the birds and the, the lilies, they don't toil. They don't worry about what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat. They don't toil over those things. Only we as human beings toil over the things that the Father, Mother, God knows that we need. Only we do that. Okay? And so this is really about relieving the temple, right? And this is why Jesus was angry because we as humanity were putting money and our needs, our earthly needs being met before God, before God. And so this temple is supposed to be a temple uh, and a house of prayer, right? Temple and house synonymous. This is supposed to be a house of prayer, right? Prayer being an inner conversation, a dialogue between you and God, not God up in the sky. When I'm doing this, I'm talking about you and the highest you, right? You as this ego, connected to well, who, this ego that feels separate, connected to God, right? You being the lowercase g, God, connected to the larger capital uh, uh, uppercase g, God, okay? So there's God, the OG, the real OG, 
Okay, then there's you, the little G. And for those of you who are like, you calling me a God? Yeah, I'm calling you a God. Jesus said in John 10, 34, go look it up. Is it not written in your law? I've said ye are gods. Jesus said this. Now, you're not going to hear that on a Sunday. Nobody going to preach that on a Sunday. Okay, not when they're using religion to try to keep you uh, out of relationship with God. They want you to come through them in order to get to your mother, father, God. I'm the oldest sibling. And guess what, y'all? My little brothers do not have to go through me to get to my mother or father. My younger brothers do not have to go through me to get to my mother and father. They can go directly to the mother and father themselves. As above, so below, y'all. As above, so below. You don't have to go through anybody or any institution to talk to your creator. Here, I am focused more on my relationship than the religion. Now, if there's a religion that actually supports my relationship, then I'm all for it. But if in any instance that religion actually takes away from my relationship to the source, it's blocking me and says, I can't go this route. I can't talk to my mother, father, God when I want to. I got to do it this way. Deuces. Deuces. Remember this, y'all. God is not Christian. The Bible is not Christian. And Jesus was not Christian. So if we are trying to walk like our, my older brother, who was a real OG, Jesus, one of the best to ever do it, then we want to move and operate off the same principles, okay? Jesus didn't baptize, we talked about that. Jesus didn't baptize, not with water, okay? With the spirit, maybe, but not, he didn't baptize, but yet we still out here getting baptized. But Jesus didn't baptize. Did Jesus get baptized? Yes, but he didn't baptize. He washed his disciples' feet, which was what? When he washed his disciples' feet, what was he do? What was the allegory behind that? When he washed his disciples' feet, what was the allegory behind that, y'all? He was washing their understanding. He was washing their understanding. Because when the foundation is right, the understanding is right, then everything that stands upon it will be righteous. Okay? So, let's keep it pushing. Again, with the temple, 78% of the workers in the United States the quote unquote land of the free and living paycheck to paycheck. Remember, this is not a black uh, white thing, y'all. African Americans make up, uh, and I only say that because I know most of you are uh, people of African descent. But before we are people of African descent, what are we, y'all? When we are really putting everything in order, before we are people of African descent, while that may be a core identity to who we are, what are we? Before anything, we are children of God. So for some of you, is children of a child of God, African American, then it's your gender, then it's your political party, then it's your profession. For some of you, it's African American, then it's child of God, then it's I'm a woman, then it's um, then it's your sexuality, then it's this. So we all have different ways of prioritizing our identities. But what I know, the thing that never changes, because you can change gender today, okay? You can even switch sides on race today. <laughs> Okay, you can switch political parties, you can switch classes, you can switch all that stuff. But the one thing that never changes, y'all, is that we are children of God. There's no way to switch that. There's no way to change that. Even if you decide to walk away and abandon God, knowing that you did not create yourself, you are still a child of God. This is what the whole story of the prodigal son is. The prodigal son left and father in this case, was still waiting with wide open arms for the prodigal son to return. It does not matter if you've abandoned God as uh, or abandoned the creator. You are still a child of God, even if you denied that inheritance yourself. Okay? So, when Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God, he, uh, he replied, his reply completely amazed him. So, Jesus knew that we operated in a world where money existed. This is why he went in and overthrew the temples, etc. And here, I think the Pharisees or the Sadducees were trying to deceive him. And he was aware that we were in this world and this world was operated and driven by money. And he said, give to Caesar what Caesar's do, which is what was on the money. And this case was taxes, okay? Now, what is, good, what is due to God, y'all? What is due to God? Is Jesus talking about tithing here, y'all? Is Jesus talking about tithing? What is due to God? Praises, faith, not money. 
What is due to God, y'all? <laughs> Our entire life. No, God doesn't just want 10% of your income. Of Listen to this. Just hear this, y'all. You think that God wants 10% of money that you got from a job that is not in alignment with the purpose that you were created to do? Just hear this. You think that God wants 10% of the money you receive from a job that is not in alignment with the purpose you were created to do? You think that's what God wants? Like, come on, y'all. God taking 10% of leftover energy no god wants all of you he wants you to walk in full faith in your purpose to do the thing that you were created to do all right so was there a rich man in the bible yes joseph of arimathea joseph of arimathea uh was the one who actually owned the land where jesus's tomb was and joseph in the bible is known as a rich disciple okay so the vibration that we are all seeking to hold is this vibration of being financially rich and spiritually rich. In fact, let me switch those. We are seeking to be spiritually rich and also manifest that as financially rich on earth as it is in heaven. Is there a way to do it? Yes. But even Jesus says himself, it is, it is very hard to hold both. He didn't say it's not possible, but it is very hard, so hard that it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get in the kingdom of heaven. This energy of money can throw you off course if you are not careful and you do not have the right relationship to it and you don't know what your true source is. If you do not know what your true source is, this energy and frequency of money can throw you off course and you ultimately start making money your God instead of God your God. Okay? You know why a lot of people pursue money? A lot of people pursue money to squeeze God out of the equation. A lot of people pursue money to squeeze God out of the equation. Because if I have enough money, I believe that I don't need any, I can do whatever I need to do, and I don't need any divine intervention. But you want to know why that's not true? You can go ask Steve Jobs right now. I'm not saying Steve Jobs is against God or anything like that but you could have all the money in the world, right? But if you fail to recognize that something outside of you is actually commanding and guiding your life, then all the money in the world won't solve every single problem. Does money help with things? Yeah. And if you make a lot of it, can you elude God? Yeah. But you may be elusive in terms of your purpose, but externally, but inwardly, you will know. You will know when you wake up and you look in the mirror. You will know. You know, for most people, y'all, their soul is for sale. Most people's soul is for sale, y'all. People are like, oh, I never sell my soul. Most people's soul are for sale. If I gave you, if I told you, I want you to scrub my floors for the next 60 years, and I'll give you a million dollars. Some of y'all would jump at that. I want you for 40 hours a week until, for, until you're 65 or whatever. For 40 hours a week for 30 years, I want you to scrub my floors with a toothbrush. Some of y'all would jump at that. A lot of y'all have a number. I think we, to be honest, I'm not even, to, I'm gonna put myself in there. A lot of us have a number. Our number may be different, like there's, there's, a, I don't know, I don't know what number you could give me to take me off the path that I'm on right now. Like to take me off the path of multifamily movement and financial church and buy back Baton Rouge right now. I don't know what number you could give me to say, you got to let all three of those things go for the rest of your life. And you got to do this instead. I don't know if there's a dollar figure that you could pay me because I feel so aligned with the creator right now that I know that the paths that I'm on are going to be more than enough. Might they be more financially than that offer that somebody presents to me? Maybe not. But the richness, the true treasure that I get from walking these paths, I don't know where else I would find that. I don't know where else I would find that. So beware of your number. 
And uh, if you do have a number, just make sure it's high. Just make sure it is really high. <laughs> Because um, that is a costly price to play. Ultimately, we don't want to have a number. You want to get to a mindset where you can't be bought, where your soul cannot be bought. All right? So we are here this Sunday, as Proverbs 46 through 10 said, to be still and know that I am God. When we yield, yield, the definition of yield is to stop, pause, or surrender. Okay? But the second definition of yield is to increase, right? As in, increase our yield, our production, our fruit. So this is what we are doing every Sunday, uh, every fourth Sunday, is we stop and we, we yield, right? So that we can yield, okay? So when we do this, when we observe our finances and our stewardship, we want to be reminded of two things, not to judge ourselves, okay? We already got enough people judging us. We don't need to judge ourselves, okay? And not to focus on the past because we have no power over the past. The only thing that we can do is plant new seeds today. So a lot of people have financial shame. They look at their credit score, they look at their bank account, they see how long they work, they see how much rent they're paying, they see uh, stuff that they spent money on that they don't use anymore, um, et cetera. And there's a lot of financial shame. Holding on to that shame does not serve us. It does not, it will only make it harder for us to step into the future. And then we cannot, focus on the path. So the reason we do this is to observe the fruits and results of our, of our old thinking, okay? Then to see what is and seek ways to be better stewards of that which we've already been given, the leaks, the hoarding, and the new sources. Then to celebrate any growth that we've had, any growth, okay? And then to weed out anything that is restricting growth and prune to facilitate new growth. This is why we do this every single uh, fourth Sunday. All right now we know here in this space we do not use the language of i am broke again i am broke is an identity okay i am broke is an identity i have very little money is a condition and it is a condition that can change an identity can change too but we never want to embrace an identity because we know that i am is two of the most powerful words in the english language because that's what god calls itself in the bible i am that i am so we want to be very careful with what we put after I am. Because even when you think about it, does this make any sense how I am, how did broke get connected to money? I am broke means that I am not functioning. I am not working. When a toy is broke, when the electronic is broke, it means that it has no use whatsoever. How did that language get connected to money? Now your financial system that you're using to guide your life may be broken. Your thinking about money may be broken, but you, you are not broke. You are not broke, okay? You are still breathing. You are still walking. You still have the ability to work. You still have the ability to contribute. You still have the ability to give, all right? You still have life force and vitality within you, so you are not broke. So be very careful of your language. We're very careful and mindful of our language, not to a fear-based standpoint here, but we are very mindful of the language that we use. We did a whole teaching on language patterns that uh, we typically use in our daily language that are unhealthy and that actually end up manifesting because our words shall never return void. So just to remind everybody, there's these three buckets and we want to be a certain type of bucket. This type of bucket, somebody who believes that they are broke, this is a bucket that receives and then it loses. And even if I pour the entire ocean into this bucket, guess what? It'll still end up empty. Even if I pour the lottery, this person wins. This is why lottery tic uh, ticket winners, they can lose the money. Even if you pour in millions of dollars into a bucket like this, it will still end up empty, y'all. Right? So this is the first type of bucket, is to receive and lose. The next type of bucket is the bucket that a lot of people end up pursuing and it is to receive only. This is where you see people stacking money in their savings account as if they can save their way to wealth. They're stacking money, they're receiving only, right? And while this is a certain short step in the equation, it is not the final step, okay? The ultimate step in the bucket that God wants to pour into most is the one that has the receiving and giving function. 
it has the receiving and the giving function. This is what is used for plants. You go get water from a source and then it has a spout in order to give that water to nourish ideals, ideas, individuals, and institutions. <coughs> Excuse me, bless me. Okay, so we ultimately want to be the third type of bucket. But again, receiving is a skill set. Many of us have been givers for a long time and we felt depleted because we hadn't developed our uh, receiving function, right? So how do we increase our wealth? It's very simple, y'all. One, we wanna stop all leaks, okay? Like bucket number one, we wanna stop all leaks. Number two, increase, so leaks in, include subscriptions that you are part of, $9.99 for this magazine that you don't even read, Leaks include uh, excessive credit card debt. Leaks include um, things that you don't use. Uh, leaks include over overpayments on insurance. Um, leaks include um, leaks include just willy nilly spending, uh, keeping cash in your wallet, and just because you have it, it goes right. Leaks include eating out more than you plan to. These are leaks. We want to stop all leaks. Next thing is you want to increase or your receiving or bucket size. Okay. A lot of us approaching God with a Dixie cup and you wonder why your cup runneth over because you, you approach God with a Dixie cup. Little Dixie cups they give you at the doctor's office to rinse your mouth. Y'all approaching God with a Dixie cup. No, we want to approach God with a big old bucket like this. Like I'm open to receive, right? So we have to increase our receiving size, which means that we have to be, um, uh, we have to give value to the world. Okay. Giving and receiving are reciprocal relationships. And then from there, we can increase our giving proportionally to the level of receiving, okay? So how do you receive? You receive when you give. I, I need to make this clear, y'all. You realize that people don't want money, y'all? Do you realize that people do not want money? This probably sounds ludicrous. People do not want money. People are readily and happily willing to give up their money if you give them something that is more valuable than the piece of paper. They know that money is just a piece of paper. People are giving away their money every single day. They're giving it to a restaurant because they don't want to cook and wash dishes or grocery shop that day. They're giving it to online stores because they want this piece of clothing that's going to go with their new shoes. They're giving it to Netflix. They're giving it to Amazon. They're giving it to the car dealership. They're giving it to colleges. People do not want money. People inherently know how worthless money is. And if you can provide something to people that is more valuable to them than those worthless pieces of paper, they will happily give it to you. Now, of course, when we receive it, we actually don't hold on to it as if uh, now we want money. No, we go immediately take that stored energy and we actually transmute it into ideals, ideas, individuals, and institutions that we believe in. But people do not want money, y'all. People do not want money. Look, y'all, if it's the end of the earth and I have um and I have uh I have 500 gallons of wa water and you got a million dollars, how much am I gonna charge you for that uh, for a gallon of water? If I have 500 gallons of water and you have a million dollars, how much am I gonna charge you? It's a little bit of a trick question. One. There's no dollar amount that you could give me that would ever satisfy the need for water. Water is the first thing that we need. It is more valuable than your million dollars. One gallon is more valuable than your million dollars. Because if I just sit here with my 500, 500 gallons, you got your million dollars, who's going who's gonna to last the longest? Okay? Now, if I had 500 uh, million gallons, uh, 500 gallons of water, I'm going to give you some water. <laughs> okay? Because that's not how I operate. But that's why it was a trick question. But this is just, this is hard for people to understand is that people actually don't want money. The moment you can give them something of more value, value than the money that they have, they will happily give it to you. Is this making sense, y'all? Is this making sense? All right. So what we're going to do right now is we are going to look at um, our assets our assets, uh, our net worth, and this is our balance sheet, okay? I want you to see yourself as an organization, okay? You have organs that operate within inside of you. You are an organ within a larger body of God, in the celestial body. You are an organ. 
And so I want you to see yourself as an organization and every organization, every life giving thing um, has its own balance sheet. So when we talk about work-life balance and balance, balance is core and in any good business assets have to, should be greater than liabilities. This actually dictates your net worth. All right. So, um, what, uh, what I'm going to encourage all of you who are new to do is to go to, if you're on Instagram, uh, go to juliangordon.com forward slash accounting, juliangordon.com forward slash accounting. You'll likely need a computer for this. You'll need a computer for this y'all. All right. This is a spreadsheet. This is a spreadsheet that I give to you all to go through this monthly accounting process that we do. Okay. So what you'll do is you'll click file, download, and then make a copy. Do not request access. You'll click file, download, make a copy, and then uh, you can make a copy to your Google Drive or you can download it as an XLS, XLSX file, I think. Okay. For those of you who are veterans, you should already have this. You should have done it the month before and the month before that, and yours should start building up. Okay. I need you to, I need you to uh, take some time. I'm going to give them a hold space for you for three minutes to begin this process. You, we will not be able to finish this. This takes me about 45 minutes on the first of every month. I did mine today, actually, instead of uh, on Tuesday, I did mine today. It takes me about 45 minutes to log into all of my accounts, my, all my check-ins accounts, all my savings accounts, all my money market accounts, stock market accounts, for, uh, I don't have a 401k, but any other type of accounts that I have, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, okay? Then all of my mortgages, okay? Then go to Truly and Zillow for the net worth of all, for the current market value of all my properties. And I know that's not exact, okay? All my credit cards, all my business accounts, right? I go in and I copy those numbers and I put them into this spreadsheet, okay? Takes me about 45 minutes. All I'm asking you to do right now during this time is to do your liquid assets, your liquid assets. Okay, so that's going to be your checking account, all your checking accounts, however many you have, your 401k, your stocks, cash apps, Venmos. I want you to put in your liquid assets. So I'm going to give you about three minutes to log into those accounts and start putting them into the column, right? After this, I encourage you to continue forward and start doing your liabilities, student loans, car loans mortgages, rental property mortgages, medical bills, et cetera, anything that you have installment payments on, any personal people that you owe, I encourage you to do that after. All I'm asking you to do right now is liquid assets. So that's basic checking, savings, 401k, stocks, et cetera, all right? Any questions? Any questions? All right. So again, after this, you will stay, uh, keep this document open. And before the end of the night, you'll add in your live, your long-term assets, which is home value. Okay. For a lot of folks, they don't have any long-term assets and that's what's sad. All right. My long-term assets, I got quite a few long-term assets that increase in value over time, right? Then you'll do your liabilities, right? Student loans, mortgages, cars if financed, and credit cards. And that will give you your net worth. That will ultimately give you your net worth, okay? Um... Gwen said, thank you for this. Prior to this, I never did a budget like this. I've been a real eye opener and easily track and easy to track monthly. Thank you so much, Gwen. Uh, I want to honor Gwen. Gwen is consistently um, gave uh, in terms of 
We don't call it tithing here. You give what feels good for you. Um, and again, you're not giving to me. You're not giving to a building fund. You're not giving to my private jet. I receive nothing from this ministry. This ministry is something that I've chosen to do purely out of love, purely out of love. I don't want money to ever be twisted or involved in this particular space. Um, and so for those of you who are new, uh, we'll share that at the end. We give differently here and uh, you'll hear about that. Um, but uh, I want to say thank you to Gwen for her consistency, her consistency. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Courtney mentioned some of you continuously skip this. Some of you continuously skip this. And I'm telling you, I've been doing this for at least six years now. I can go back and show you month by month by month how I got to where I am. Month by month by month, I can show you how I got to where I am in terms of my net worth. All right. This has been one of the most powerful rituals to me. This, why do you think I would take out an entire Sunday to make sure that you all do this if it was not important? I, I don't, we don't have time for fluff, y'all. I'm not just asking you to do this because it's cute. I'm asking you to do this because I know how powerful this process of declaring that I'm going to be a better steward of my economic resource by actually observing what I'm doing with my economic resource. Some of you, because of financial shame, don't want to look at these numbers. Okay, remember, these numbers are a reflection of what, y'all? These numbers are a reflection of what? These numbers are a reflection of your past thinking. They are not a reflection of who you are today. They are not a reflection of who you are today, okay? So don't beat yourself up. These numbers are seeds that the old you planted that are now coming to reap today. And so the reason you're here on Sunday at Financial Church is to plant new thought seeds so that one, two, three months from now, these numbers look differently because of the thought seeds that you planted today. If we never look at these numbers, then many of us are sitting here praying for some big raise, some big financial opportunity, some big financial windfall, the lottery, uh, a relative dying and us getting um, money inherited. We're sitting here praying and hoping for something to fall out of the sky. And this is not how it works. I have improved my financial life by observing monthly. I don't, I'm not like these day traders. And I know there are a lot of people out there doing stock options, things of that nature. I don't operate like that. I do not want to be attached to measuring my money every single day. That is not my frequency. Other people have different frequencies and that's all good. For me, this monthly rhythm has been a healthy one for me. Okay. And so this is why I'm sharing this practice with you. All right. Cool. So the next thing that we do is uh, on the next sheet over, you'll see worksheets at the bottom, and that is our cash flow. Okay, this is what some people call a budget, and your cash flow is your revenues minus expenses equals your income. Now I need to clarify this for people who are new. What your job or what you've been calling your income is not your income. What you have been calling your income is not your income. Your income is revenues minus expenses. What you get paid and what you've been calling income is actually your revenues. What you've been calling income is actually your revenues, right? So your salary is actually your, not your income, it's your revenues. Then you have your living expenses and what's left over at the end of the month, that is your true income. This is how a business operates. A business's income is not what it gets in revenues. A business's income is what it has left over after it's paid all its expenses. So for you as an individual entity, even if you're not an LLC, is you have your salary, which is your revenues, not your income. And the problem is, is that because the trickery of this system got you to recognize that as your income, guess what? Now they tax you on your revenues. A business gets taxed on its true income after expenses. An individual gets taxed on their revenues because they've accepted the language that their revenue is income. This is why Warren Buffett has a lower tax rate than his secretary. Not a lower tax amount, but a lower tax rate than his secretary. Okay? So 
Uh, if you are looking for the sheet, it's juliangordon.com forward slash accounting. Gordon.com forward slash accounting. Okay. Y'all with me? Checking on the Instagram folks. Instagram, uh, y'all are going to cut out in um, a little bit. Uh, I will restart. Okay. If it cuts out, I will restart and have you back up in 60 seconds. So just go back to my profile. Um, if it cuts out, um, it's not counting down yet, but soon uh, y'all are going to cut out. Okay. Uh, but oh, if you're on Instagram, actually everybody on Instagram, go to juliangordon.com forward slash TFC. juliangordon.com forward slash TFC, the financial church. That'll allow you to join us here in Zoom and you won't have to worry about getting cut out. All right. So there's quite a few of you on IG right now. Um, go to juliangordon.com forward slash TFC and join us here live in Zoom so that you can actually see the PowerPoint. All right. So on the next sheet over, the next sheet over, uh, what I want you to do in this next three minutes is I want you to put your, uh, your actual revenues and as many of your expenses from the past month as possible. Okay. So for many of you, if you have a single source of revenue, which is your job, you should know that number. It should be pretty consistent. And if you get paid bi-weekly, um, you just uh, multiply it by two and you'll put that in there. Um, this is also dangerous to only have one source of revenue, okay? It is dangerous to only have one source of revenue, all right? Uh, I, that's, we are the incomes generation. We are meant to have multiple streams of income. Okay, I have one, two, three, one, two, three. If I broke up all my properties as 12, then once I have at least 17 streams of income, y'all. If I broke up all my properties, I would have 17 streams of income. If I don't break up all my properties, um, that becomes a uh, about six streams of income. Okay. So this is dangerous. If you only have one source of income, you have all kinds of expenses. You have like 12 reoccurring monthly expenses, but only one source of income or one source of revenues. Okay. Be very mindful with our language. You have one source of revenue, but tons of source of expenses. That does not make sense. Right. It is dangerous. So go ahead. I'm giving you about two more minutes. If you only have one source of revenue, then that number should be easy. You probably know what that number is off the top of your head, but then go get uh, your cell phone bill should be consistent every single month, unless you go over and you should not go over. You need to upgrade your plan. If you keep going over your rent or your mortgage should be, should be consistent. Uh, water power, um, those fluctuate. Okay. Depending on the temperature. Um, groceries also fluctuates. Restaurants fluctuate, car maintenance, that fluctuates. Car insurance should be consistent. Gas fluctuates. If you have a Metro card in New York, that's gonna be consistent, even though I think the price of that went up recently, right? So this will show you how much money you actually gained in income this past month. Some of you will realize that you worked for an entire 30 days, had expenses during that 30 days, and actually, therefore, made nothing. This is called the rat race. You worked for 30 days, brought in $4,000 after taxes and health insurance, etc. Your cost of living was $3,900. And so you worked for 30 days, and all you gained was $100. That's sickening. That is sickening. Okay, so I need you to become aware of what is actually occurring so that we can actually make changes. The first step of Alcoholics Anonymous is to admit or affirm, or not affirm, but to admit and recognize that you are an alcoholic. All right, so the first step in financial awareness is being fully aware of how your cash is flowing, what your net worth is and how much income you actually have, not revenues, how much income you have. A lot of people have, the goal is to have more money at the end of the month, but a lot of people have more months at the end of the money. Okay, <laughs> we don't want that. 
All right. If you are skipping this right now, if you're like, oh, no, I'll do it later, forget it, I'm cool, or I don't want to look at it, in chat, can you please tell me why? Can you please tell me why? Because I need to be able to speak to it. I need to be able to address it. If you are skipping this right now, if you are resisting it, there's probably resistance coming up in you. I know, but once you get in this habit and once you start to see the tables turn and you see growth, you'll want to do it. When you see things going backwards, you're not going to want to do it. But when you start seeing the tables turning and you start to see growth, you're going to be excited to do it because you're going to see how much you actually grew. So Joe says he uses QuickBooks. Good. Uh, Cassie is doing this while driving. That's okay. Barbara's driving. Fatima, it's juliangordon.com forward slash accounting. Carmelita did hers earlier. She's driving now. Cool. Somebody's going to, uh, uh, Marlena said, I'm happy to be watching two story later on a computer. Uh, it's scary. It's scary. I know. I know it's scary. What's scary is uh, working for your entire life and having no assets. That's scary. All right. And so once you become a present to where you're at and what's actually happening, how your money's actually flowing, we can actually uh, start to turn things around. We can start to think about ways to earn money without trading time for money, okay? Because you realize, y'all, financial freedom is when your passive income is greater than your cost of living. When your passive income is greater than your cost of living. Do you all know that debt-free, being debt-free does not mean you are financially free? How many of you knew that? How many knew that? Being debt-free does not mean that you are financially free. I know a lot of you are on the Dave Ramsey tip or whatnot. Debt-free does not mean that you are financially free. Why does it not mean that you're financially free? Why does debt-free mean does not mean that you're financially free? Who knows? You still have bills, close. Still have monthly expenses? No. Nope. You're close. Is because you still have no act, you still have no passive income. All your you could be debt free, but if all your income is still active, it still means that you are trading time for money. Financial freedom is when your passive income is greater than your cost of living, not your active income. There are a lot of people out there in the world whose active income is greater than their cost of living. That's great. That's a step forward. But financial freedom is when your passive income is greater than your cost of living. This is why you just being debt free does actually not mean that you are financially free. And what happens for a lot of people is that their cost, when their ink, when their salary goes up, what happens to their cost of living, y'all? When their salary goes up, what happens to their cost of living for a lot of people? Their cost of living goes up. Oh, I'm making a little bit more money. Yeah, I'm going to take this extra vacation. I'm going to buy these higher end shoes. I'm going to go out to the restaurant on Friday and Saturday night. We're going to do this. Oh, I can afford that now. And so now your salary has gone up, but your cost of living, your salary went up $10,000, but then your cost of living also went up. Now your salary went up $10,000. How much is that actually, y'all? Your salary went up $10,000. How much did it actually go up? How much of that are you receiving? You receiving maybe seven of it, right? But now you say, oh, because my salary went up, now I can go on that vacation. Now I can go uh, buy these shoes, et cetera. And now your expenses have gone up by 8,000. So you actually gone backwards. You running harder, you running harder, but making less progress. You are running harder, but making less progress because of the perception that you, you making more because you focus on revenues and not income. You hear these businesses out here saying, oh yeah, uh, he or she has a million dollar business. Most of the time they are focused and telling you about the business's revenues. Do not be allured by the revenues. The fact that somebody can make a million dollars in revenue, that's great. That's definitely a start, okay? It means they're doing something right. They have a product or service that's winning. But the true indicator of the success of a business is not just its revenues, it's its income. What if their profit margin is only 10%? That means that off that million dollars, they actually only kept 100,000. 100,000 is still good, right? That's still six figures. 
but just don't be deceived by the revenue number. All right. Is that clear? Is that clear? Do not be deceived by your salary or the revenue number. The most important number is knowing what our income is. All right. So, so uh, with that, um, again, we, we're trying to get out of these situations. Um, and uh, we have to remember what the poverty mindset is and what the wealth mindset is. You cannot save your way to wealth. All right. So poverty mindset is I'm too broke to invest. Wealthy mindset, my mindset is I invest until I'm broke. Mm -hmm. Poverty mindset is I'm too broke to invest. Wealthy mindset is I invest until I'm broke. Y'all, I'm doing really well financially. You cannot ask me to borrow money right now. Why? Because I have no cash to give to you. All my money is back out in play. It is all out in the world working for me. I have no money that's just sitting on the sidelines that you can borrow. Okay. I have no money that you can borrow. I am on 100% offense right now. A lot of y'all are playing defense when you have nothing to defend. A lot of y'all are playing financial defense when you have nothing to defend. You got $10,000 in your account. That's nothing to defend. Why are you playing defense? That whole $10,000, we need to be putting that all out on something. What did Nipsey Hussle say? All money in. He said, ain't no point in playing defense. That's why I dove up the deep end inward. Okay? All money in. Don't just wear the t-shirt and the hat and not live by the principle. Don't just wear the t-shirt and the hat and not live by the principle. We want all money in. Okay? So that requires faith. It requires being a good steward. It requires doing due diligence. But if you think that saving, you're going to be able to save your way to wealth, you you in for something. All right? So what we have to do is we have to take, uh, there's three ways to get money. It's the ACE method. Employer, you can get money from an employer, you can get money from customers, or you can get money from assets. Okay? So getting money from an employer, that's hard work for others. And you get money through 401k, salary 401k, and a pension if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. Then um, you can get money from, now you can take that money that you're getting from an employer and you can go build a business that then allows people, that allows you to get customers. This is hard working for yourself. So you can get cash from a business that you run directly, or you can be an affiliate or advertiser to help others get customers, okay? Or you could take the money from your employer and actually go buy or build assets, okay? These require the littlest work. Initially, they actually require heavy work upfront, but then they should be on autopilot after that. So this is an investment property, like multifamily properties that I teach people to buy, info product, right? Um, st stocks and bonds, savings interest, uh, which is very low, 0.03%, and then business you own, but don't uh, work in daily, okay? This is, that's, uh, that's true wealth, when you actually don't even have to work in the business, all right? So the, the, I don't know any other ways, and then of course, if you inherit, if you inherit money because someone dies, but besides that, these are the three ways that you can get money. You can get it from an employer, from a customer, or an asset. All right. So let's shift over into uh, our two comma club uh, visualization. This is what we do every single month. And every single month, this is probably changing for you. It's evolving because your preferences are changing. You're learning more about yourself. You're learning more about what you want. It's really hard to get what you want if you don't know what you want. It is really hard to get what you want if you do not know what you want. And so we uh, do this process every single month and some of you will see that your visions are changing, okay? So what I want you to do is pause for a second, put all pencils down, put the, close, the lap, uh, close the laptop if you open it up separately. And I want, you to, I want you to stare at this slide, okay? I want you to stare at this slide. And I want you to imagine that you open up your phone and that you saw this when you logged into your account. But you open up your phone and this is what you see. I want you to get this image embedded in your subconscious mind. 
Go ahead and memorize the number. 1,532,379.46. The 1,532,379.46 with another 100,000 in my personal savings. 1 million, 1.5 million, 1.5 million. I want you to capture this image in your head. Okay. Now I want you to close your eyes. Of course, we're not going to let it sit there. We're going to put that money to work. But I just want you to close your eyes now. And I'm going to ask you some questions and I just want you to let your mind go. So when you look at your phone, what room are you in? What room are you in? What city? What time of day is it? Spin in your chair, look around, and if you have 3D goggles on, what are you wearing? Look down at yourself and what are you wearing? How's the weather outside? What's the temperature? Is there anybody in that room with you? Or is it just you? What did you eat for breakfast? Have you eaten breakfast? How did you start your day? How do you feel right now? Three words, how do you feel right now? You working for somebody, you working for yourself, other people working for you. What's next on your agenda? What does your to-do list look like today? What are your plans this weekend? Are there kids in this day? Friends? Significant other, exercise. Are you at home? Are you at the office? Are you driving? What are you driving? What kind of emails and text messages are you getting? You feel any stress? What are your plans this evening? What are you gonna do with this money? Is it gonna sit there? Where are you gonna transmute it into? Who, what, where, when? What are you building? How's your health? Is there green on your plate? Is you exercise? Did you connect with your creator? If so, how? Stay right here today. One million five hundred and twenty thirty two thousand three hundred seventy nine dollars and forty six cents with another hundred thousand as your emergency fund. Open your eyes when you're ready.
So with our image in nation, we have the ability to visualize, reach out into the future and bring it into the present. We must get full of the feeling in order to have fulfillment. You want to get fulfilled, meaning full of the feeling of wealth, abundance, ease, impact, joy, peace, love, happiness, calm. You want to get the full feeling which we just did here and now, and you have to do that before you get the fulfillment. The fulfilling, you can access that right now, and we did. The fulfillment will be when the conditions start to match the feeling. That's the beauty of it, y'all. We can tap into a feeling whenever we desire to with the power of our imagination. You know, some people call it imagination. I call it imagination, and that's what we did. We took one image, and from that image, we started painting a picture of a world. We literally painted a picture of a world. Words create worlds. And they say an image speaks a thousand words. One image, and from that image, looking at our phone, seeing that as our bank account, we started painting a world. That world is actually possible for you to experience. And so now our work bringing heaven on earth is to now bring that world to our present moment so that one day we actually wake up in that world. And what we have to do is hold the feeling and that vibration of this, of that world here and now so that we are a vibrational match for it. Okay. Some of y'all are like, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? I'm a living example of it, y'all. I'm a living example of it. You hold the feeling, and then the outward experience has to match. <laughs> it has to match. <laughs> Here's a challenge, y'all. For some of you, and, and I won't say some of you, all of us, now that we've come out of the meditation, and out of the visualization, what happens is fear, doubt, and worry start to creep up. Oh, that's not possible. How are you going to do that when this happened? You ain't got enough to do that. You ain't smart enough to do that. You ain't got the skill set. How are you going to have that and do that too? Nah, that's not. You don't even have that person in your life yet. You still single. The doctor told you you can't have kids. You overweight. You love french fries too much. That's me, y'all. <laughs> That's mine. You love french fries too much. You a workaholic. You can't get out of that. That's going to be with you for the rest of your life. You ain't never seen numbers like that. Your grandfather made that amount of money and he lost it all. Like these stories start coming up. These limited beliefs start coming up. Go ahead. Let me know. Let me know what's coming up for you. What are the, now that we're out of that visualization and we're back to the present moment, what are, what's that voice saying? Fear, doubt, and worry. Those are usually the three places that it's coming from. What, what's coming up for you in your story? I'm too old. Good one, Joe. How? Yep, the how question. How is not our business. No one will support you. Fear of failure. How am I going to do that? Stress, fear. Time is not on my side. Okay, so I hear you. So let me address those two, the how and the time. Listen to this, y'all. For the how, what does scripture say, y'all? What does scripture say about the how? Of myself, I do nothing. It is the Father in me that doeth the works. The scripture says, of myself, I can do nothing. It is the Father in me that doeth the works. Jesus was not worried about the how. Jesus knew that if he just held the condition, 
that the Father, the God in him, would actually cause the unfoldment. Remember, a farmer does not know how to grow an apple. All it knows is how to create the conditions for that apple to grow. A woman does not know how to put a baby together, but a woman's womb creates the conditions for that baby to grow, and God in her does the works. Okay? So that's first and foremost. Our responsibility as guard inners, as guards of our inner, are to plant the seed, water it, okay, weed, and then uh, PWWP, and then prune. Excuse me, this is why I love my own, ac my own acronyms. PWWP, let me charge this phone. All right, cool. Okay, so for all of you who are worried about the how, Remember, that's not your work. That is for the God in you to figure out the how. You just have to hold the conditions. Is that clear? For those of you who are worried about time, what does the Bible say about time, y'all? How fast can it happen? In the twinkling of a, in the twinkling of a what? In the twinkling of an eye, it can happen. It can change just like that. Snap your fingers just like that. That is the power of the God in you. In the twinkling of an eye, it can unfold when you are in alignment. When you are fully out of the way, all your limiting beliefs, your fears, doubt, and worries are out of the way, it can happen in the twinkling of an eye. All right, so watch this. Let me prove it to you. How long does it take to become a millionaire, y'all? How long does it take to become a millionaire? I'll prove it to you, watch. How long does it take to become a millionaire? Yeah, God does not operate on time. Time is a man-made concept. See, nobody has an answer to my question. How long does it take to become a millionaire? Super cent. Sold what? What was it? A crayon colored nails or cosmetics or something? One day, millionaire. One day. Now, of course, was there groundwork and conditions that she created prior to that? Yes. One day she become a millionaire. And one day. For some people, it's gonna take 40 years to become a millionaire. Oh, when I retire and I'm 65, I can't wait. And I'll look at my 401k and I'll be a millionaire. And what does scripture say? It is done unto you as you believe. You believe that it's going to take you 40 years to become a millionaire? It'll take you 40 years to become a millionaire. If you believe that it can happen in a day and you create the right conditions for that to occur, it could happen in a day. Your responsibility is the conditions. There is no timeline to become a millionaire. And again, I only say this, I'm only using these money terms as an example, okay? This is not the only thing that we manifest. We are not infatuated with money here, okay? But I'm just saying as an example, because this is financial church and we're talking about financial spirituality, this, it could be anything. How long does it take to build uh, find love? That's another one, y'all. How long does it take to find love, y'all? Is there a timeline for it? Is there a timeline to find love? Some people find it love at first sight. Some people never. Some people 10 years. Some people three years. Some people a weekend in the good one, Michelle, in the right time. There's no timeline for God. God does not operate on time. Time is man-made. So for those of you who think that the clock is against you, that is a man-made concept, God can operate as long as you have created conditions for such. What was Morgan Freeman started his acting career real late, I believe. I, I believe he started his acting career real late, okay? So we want to be on divine timing and we realize that the how is not for us to figure it out. For, it's for us to create the conditions and be guards of our inner by planting, watering, weeding, and pruning. Then we let God do the rest. Is that clear? I, I'm glad that you shared those objections with me because um, I see I, I, those are honest objections and uh, we had to address those. All right. So uh, with that, we're going to bring heaven down to earth. Right. We don't just talk in the sky. 
uh, actually, I don't even like to use the sky because then that, that perceives that God is in the sky. No, we don't just talk up here, right? Uh, we bring it down to earth. And our whole work for all of us is to bring heaven, our mental experience, down to earth, which is our material experience. And so uh, what I want you to do is I want you to pick one of these. Um, in the past, I've had you do four of them. I want you to pick one of these in terms of how you're going to be a better steward of money. You're either going to decrease an expense by doing something specific, by a specific amount, or by doing something specific, or you're going to increase revenues by this amount, by doing something specific, or you're going to decrease your liabilities by this amount, by doing something specific, or you're going to increase your assets by this amount, by doing something specific. I want everybody to choose one and type it in the chat when you're ready. I want everybody to choose one and type it in the chat when you're ready. For those of you on Instagram, it looks like they removed the hour long limit um, on, they removed the hour long limit. So uh, I did not have to restart it, which is good. That's good. But I know a lot of you came over to Zoom anyways. Again, if you want to make sure you don't miss this next week, go to juliangordon.com forward slash TFC, which stands for The Financial Church. So Joe is going to decrease expenses by $500. Joe, I need to know exactly how you're going to do that. Um, Andrea is going to increase assets by building my her multifamily stash. Give me an exact number, Andrea. Larissa is going to decrease expenses by not shopping on Amazon. Good. Um, Amita is going to increase revenues with rents. Good. Um, Anton, increasing my revenue by getting a consulting project. Beautiful. Anton, give me a number. You're going to charge $3,000 for that project or what? Becky, decrease expenses by $200 by uh, cutting her cable and phone. Beautiful. Leslie, increase income by seeking another job. Understood. Leslie, I want you to put a dollar figure on how much you want to increase your income. Uh, Sam, decrease expenses by $100 by getting better car insurance policy. Beautiful, Sam. Very specific. Keisha, increase by $500 by online store. I guess she's selling, Keisha's selling things in her online store. Regina, I need you to be more specific than decrease liabilities. Gwen, increase assets by $5,000 by adding to stock market. Beautiful, Gwen. Um, oh, Joe said not eating out and buying online. La, uh, La Elena said decrease expenses by $500 by paying off her credit card. And Letitia said increase rents by $100 total. So she's gonna increase rents on her tenants. She might not have to increase them over a period of time. And now that uh, we're kind of coming out of Corona, I think that's a fair thing to do, especially if they were under market. Good, good, good. All right. So. With that, I want to move to our affirmation, our affirmation, um, and this is our affirmation that we use every uh, fourth Sunday, and uh, I want you to read it with me, okay? I'm going to start it uh, in three seconds. One, two, three. I am a millionaire. I am already a millionaire in my mind. I may not see it yet, but I believe it now. In the same way a seed is called by its finished form, I'm accepting my divine inheritance as a child of God. I'm meant to have life and have it more abundantly. My treasure on earth shall correspond directly to the treasure in the heaven of my mind. Abundance is my birthright. Ashe, amen, and so it is. We'll read that one more time. I am a millionaire. I am already a millionaire in my mind. I may not see it yet, but I believe it now. In the same way a seed is called by its finished form, I'm accepting my divine inheritance as a child of God. I'm meant to have life and have it more abundantly. My treasure on earth shall correspond directly to the treasure in the heaven of my mind. Abundance is my birthright. Ashe, amen, and so it is. So this whole notion of uh, I am already, you realize that when you uh, realize that you already have it, then you are already. When you realize that it's already yours, you are already to receive it. You must realize that it is already yours in order to receive it. Just sit, sit with that for a second. It is already yours. The storehouse is wide open. You are a child of the CEO of Abundant Bank. It is already yours. And once you recognize it is already yours, remember the only thing cutting my daughter off right now is her awareness and her readiness to receive it. That's it. 
if she was 12 years old and knew how to manage all these properties, I'd happily hand it over to her right here and now. Okay. So as children of God, that is our call right now. All right. So um, we are going to uh, switch into our giving portion. For those of you who are new, uh, we give differently here. This is not for a building fund. As you can see, there's no building. Okay. Um, we actually, I actually think that churches are the uh, most useless piece of real estate in the entire world. They mostly get used on Sundays only. Of course, they have offices in there during the week, but the main sanctuary gets used maybe two days a week, right? Um, so it's a waste of money and time. Uh, waste built these big physical institutions. He would have never built that. Okay. Um, when he was, when he mentioned church, that's not what he was talking about. He, when he was serving and he's speaking, he was speaking outside um, from the water or on a mountaintop. Okay. He would have never built uh, that kind of temple. He knew that the temple was here. Okay. So um, this is not for a building fund. This is not my, for my foreign car, my private jet. Uh, in fact, I take nothing from this ministry. What I get from this ministry is the opportunity to serve you and to give freely in this way. And that is more than enough for me. I take nothing financially from this ministry whatsoever. Um, here, we believe that giving is a spiritual practice and that giving moves you from scarcity to abundance. That's the only purpose is that it moves you from scarcity to abundance, helping you realize going from, I don't have to, actually I do have something, okay? Um, this is uh, how we operate here is that we give up to $800 per week to nonprofits doing good or God's work or individuals for needs such as groceries, gas, utilities, childcare, transportation, um, medicine, or, and school supplies, especially school supplies now that the school year is starting, okay? This is how we operate here. Um, all the money that we receive, we try to give it back out, okay? This is not to be stored in some sort of safe. I just heard the Mormons, they had like a hundred, hundred million, no, like a billion dollars like stored just stored money, just stored energy. Like, it's just, people are just off, man. But uh, I do have some exciting news, y'all. Last week, last week, and I'm actually gonna show you the accounting. These are, this is the Cash App. Um, the Cash App uh, and is my, is my Cash App, my Venmo or my PayPal. And we operate in full transparency here. I'm gonna show you the actual account status. So you're like, oh, is he just talking? in? No, that's not how we operate here. Y'all already know that. Um, I'm about to show you the, uh, I'm about to share my screen and show you the actual transaction since we started, full transparency. Like I don't know any other uh, fi uh, institution that operates like uh, we do here um, in full transparency. Uh, I'll show you, this is uh, how we move y'all. Look at this, we started on um, April 12th. These are every single transaction that has been made. Um, these greens are us giving the money out. Um, and you can see that we started out giving, we started out giving $300 per week. We're now up to giving $800 per week away to primarily nonprofits that are doing good or God's work in the world. And I have some exciting news, y'all. Um, last week, last week, y'all, this moved my heart. And again, this is not about size, but last week we got a $900 contribution and a $1,000 contribution last week. Those were the two largest contributions that we've received to date. Um, I don't put any contribution above or below. If you give $1, I receive it, we receive it just the same. But this was just very, it was just inspiring to see uh, that we are tracking at such a high level. And I'm grateful uh, to everyone who gave. Um, equally, okay. But I just wanted to share that 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 was um, that was just it was a sign that we are doing something right. That's all. It was a sign that we are doing something right, um, and I'm grateful for everyone. Okay. <laughs> so um, with that, again, you can give right now. Our account balance is at thirty four uh, thirty four uh, hundred, and so this week we're actually going to give out since we received so much this week. And remember, we are actually demonstrating the same principles as a collective. We are demonstrating the same principles uh, that we are uh, that we are preaching on. So actually, what we're going to do is we're going to give out since we received so much this week, we are going to give out one thousand five hundred dollars, okay, to six organizations. Since we received so much in this past week, 
we're going to give out more. This is how we operate, y'all. We receive more, we give more. We receive more, we give more. It just makes sense. We receive more, we give less. No, it doesn't operate. That we don't think like that. So, what's today's date? The thirtieth. You realize, y'all, that we've had this account since um, April twelfth, and it is never depleted. Look at this, y'all. This is this account has never depleted. Look at, just watch it, watch it. It went from one hundred dollars, my first contribution, to up to a thousand, then down to the nine hundreds, then back up to a thousand, then two thousands, then we gave down to thousands, then up to two thousands, then we even got as low two thousands, high two thousands, then it went down to uh, back to the one thousand, two thousands, then went down to the thousands, back to two thousands. Like we are demonstrating how this law operates. We are the bucket that receives and gives. And as a result of how we're doing this collectively, our bucket is getting bigger. We started out with a little Dixie cup and now we keep on expanding and uh, money keeps flowing to us and through us through this particular faith fund, all right? So this is just absolutely beautiful demonstration. Look, y'all, we got down to 900. We got down to the 900s and all of a sudden, look, just when you might slip into fear and doubt and worry because we are dropping down to the 900s after being at high 2000s. Look what occurred, y'all. Two of our greatest gifts uh, pushed us back up to 3000, to the highest point. Like we went down to one of our lowest points in a long time, only to skyrocket back up. What God was testing was how much faith we had. This is why we call it the faith fund. We know that this fund will never, ever deplete. We know that this fund will never deplete because we are operating based on the universal laws that exist. This is a demonstration, okay? So again, um, for those of you who are new, here's the Cash App um, and, uh, and um, Venmo or PayPal. And uh, right now what I want to do is take um, nonprofit recommendations. I want to take nonprofit recommendations for this week. I need the URL, okay? I got one from Wallace. Got one from Wallace. We got one here. All right. I need uh, I need five more recommendations. So Wallace says, "Food from the poor." Come on, y'all. Need five more recommendations. Vitality Village Inc. from Pearl. So this is from Wallace. This is from Pearl. Uh, okay, and again, we do not focus on the amount that you give. What we encourage is full participation. All we want is participation. If you only have a dollar to give, then you got a dollar to give. That's cool. Um, we don't judge or over celebrate based on amount. What we are looking for is participation because we just want you to be in the habit of giving. Okay, we just want you to be in the habit of giving because we know that that is what activates the universal laws. All right. Again, this is not for me. This is not for an institution. This goes to individuals and organizations that we believe in, okay? Um, that's my cash app, Joe. Uh, if you have to use a different one, then um, if you have to use Venmo or PayPal, please do so. But that is my cash app. Uh, everybody, most people use cash app, so I'm there. Two L's, I-E-N. All right, we got FHA International, NCBA. We got UNICEF. All right, and one more Africa Well Fund. Boom. All right, I'll take two backups, two backups, two backups. I need URLs, two backups. Come on, y'all. Y'all giving me some of these big ones. Uh, please help me find the little ones that are in need. These big ones get plenty. Uh, these big ones get plenty, y'all. Please help me find the little ones that um, are, are, are in need, all right? I got I got Africa well, y'all. Oh, oh, I need to Africa well. I need two backup ones, y'all. Help me find the little ones. They're the ones that your friends run, things of that nature. All right, thank you, Deirdre. International Youth Leadership Institute, and then the Confess Project. All right, so I got two backups. Beautiful. All right. So this money will be sent out uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. 
Um, I want to thank you all. I saw a ton of uh, contributions uh, come in and um, I will uh, count for those and uh, we'll see where our fun ends up uh, next week. Next week, we are finishing our series on about my father's business. Um, it is the last part of our five part series and we're going to be talking about divine compensation how to think about how you were compensated for the good work that you were doing in the world, the good work and the God work that you were doing in the world. Um, I look forward to teaching that. That will conclude our series on about my father's business. So uh, again, for those of you um, who uh, did not get a chance to finish your accounting, I encourage you to do so. That is juliangordon.com, juliangordon.com forward slash accounting. That will give you the spreadsheet. You should do your balance sheet and you should do your income statement for the past month. Um, and you will use that every, uh, every close to Sunday to the first of the month. We do that monthly accounting ritual. All right. So with that, I want to say, I love y'all. I wish y'all the best. Um, I wish y'all abundance and, uh, I will see you all soon. Those of you multifamily movement, I will talk to you in a couple hours as we get ready for that call, our weekly deal room call. And for everyone else, the replay will be up at thefinancialchurch.com. That'll be at thefinancialchurch.com likely tomorrow, the financial church.com tomorrow all right so that's where all the replays are um that'll also take you to my youtube channel uh again i appreciate you share this message uh, i'm thinking about uh i'm thinking about getting ready to start marketing this message a little bit more y'all um right now we've just been attracting organically and uh based on you sharing and you bringing folks and telling folks about it you finding me on instagram or youtube etc uh, I think it's almost time. Uh, I'm feeling for it. I'm talking to God to see if it's time to put the pedal to the metal. I think the world needs this more than ever now that uh, we are in this midst of uh, this external, seemingly external perceived scarcity, while there's a group of people like us who are still holding this wealth consciousness. And uh, I believe that this teaching um, and this way of thinking about money will close the gap for millions and millions of people. So uh, keep praying for me on that, as well as our next series. I don't know what that is yet. Um, so any prayers that you can send my way for clarity, for guidance, for divine direction, I receive that. All right. So with that, wish you all well. I will talk to you next Sunday. Much love, y'all.